All right, anatomy students, here we go, our next video. Today we are going to be talking about the vertebral column. Dang, my lines are getting nice and straight now. Uh, our objective is that I can correctly name a vertebra of the spine and I can label regions of the vertebral column. Just so we know how we're calling things, um, when you see the word vertebra, that's singular, one vertebra. If there's multiple, they're called vertebrae. We don't call them vertebras. That sounds like a push-up bra or something making things vertical. That's not what we want. So vertebra is singular. Let's get the show moving. Just so we're clear, the uh, for the development of uh, vertebrae, humans were born with 33. Okay, so 33 is what we start out with. Um, as we grow up, the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae, they fuse together to form what we call the sacrum and the coccyx. So kids actually have more bones than adults, and you maybe have heard of that before, 206 is what we have as adults. You actually had more when you were younger, and that's because the bottom portion of your vertebrae have all fused. The sacrum right there, and then the coccyx down below has turned into two bones instead of being nine. All right, so as an adult, you have 26 bones in your body. I mean, 26 bones in your vertebral column, and the vertebrae are divided into groups based on the location. You can kind of see their names. This is where we're going to be heading. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, coccyx, all right? So you kind of see our spinal cord or your vertebral column. All right, so we'll start out with the cervical vertebrae, okay? This is what we call the neck region, cervical, okay? All right, just this neck, you can see up here, circle and all this cool stuff. All right, so the very first vertebra that you need to know, actually it has a special name, is what we call the C1, or we can call it the atlas. You remember atlas held up the world, uh, I don't know, Greek or Roman mythology. So this is the top vertebra that the head rests on. So kind of like the earth, your head is a big fat globe that this bone needs to hold up. It also allows your head to move in the yes motion. Okay, remember those occipital condyles? They're going to articulate with these two little smooth spots right here. This is the atlas or C1. You see these two little spots, one right there, one right there. When we move our head up and down, those condyles are actually rotating on these little two sockets. All right, so that's the C1 or atlas. Either one is an acceptable name. All right, the next bone that we need to know is called the C2. Okay, do you notice the numbering here should make some logical sense, I'm hoping. Okay, C2, C1, what do you think the third one's going to be called? C3, C4, C5. There are seven cervical vertebrae, okay? So C2, sometimes called axis, a uh, good way to remember this, an axis is the uh, rotation point, right? Uh, the earth rotates on an axis. Your head rotates on this axis. So it's the second vertebra, allows the no motion of the head. The way it does this is it has this cool little feature, this little projection right there called the dens. And that's going to be our, our uh, only feature that you need to know. The dens, it's a vertical projection. Um, Unfortunately, this vertical projection, you see how it kind of articulates with this little soft spot or this little, um, little socket, I guess you could say there, full fossa on the atlas. Um, this is what snaps off during a severe whiplash accident. So a uh, pretty famous case of a whiplash, uh, Dale Earnhardt died in 2001. NASCAR driver ran into the wall. His neck snapped. When somebody says they snapped their neck in whiplash, this little projection can snap right off. When we get into the class, make sure you feel the dents with your finger. And you can see this little bony projection uh, that can break off and get jammed into your brainstem, basically, right? And that's going to pretty much kill you instantly. Not a cool way to go. Um, all right. Happy times. Let's move on to the next rest of the vertebrae. All right. There were how many cervical? Seven cervical vertebrae. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae. I know it sounds funny, but still, 12 thoracic. All right. So these are going to be this region. These are all posterior to the thoracic cavity, where your heart and lungs are. All your ribs are attached to the T1 through T12 vertebrae. So in a test, I might label, say, this vertebrae right here and ask you, tell me which vertebrae that is. Well, you'd have to start T1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, that's the T5. Nice, nice, nice drawing skills there. All right. So, if there are T1 through T12 vertebrae and all the ribs are attached to them, how many ribs do you think there are? One on each side. 
If you got 24, you'd be correct. There are 24 ribs. All right. So here's a nice little picture of that. Uh, you can see our little ribs. Uh, you see our sternum. Uh, the first seven ribs are what we call true ribs, and then the ones below are what we call false. It has to do with this cartilage that's holding. Um, you can see near how a rib is actually attached to the uh, back. So this is our actual vertebrae. This little hole right here is where the nerves come through. This is like your uh, spinal cord travels through here. Um, you see all these little bumps. These are those bumps you see on your back, the spinous process of each vertebrae. And then these little uh, pads right here, it's called the body, okay? Um, these little pads are where your little intervertebral discs are going to be sitting. You can actually kind of see a little space in between each vertebra down there. And that's when we hear things called slip discs, where the actual stuff moves out of the way. Um, let's take a little closer look now at ribs and sternum. So the sternum, or breastbone, okay, so this is another one of those words that we're going to want to know. Sternum, wow, that looked bad. Let's try that again. All right, sternum, it has three parts, the body manubrium and xiphoid process oh my s got cut off there i don't know where that is but here I'll... there we go um and then there's one feature that i want you to be clear on something called the suprasternal notch and that is part of the manubrium also known as the jugular notch wow that's ugly all right so here's our thoracic cage anterior view i can see the manubrium right there you can see it's this top portion of the sternum. This is all part of the sternum, right? The three parts. I have the body. That's the big part. When you do CPR, this is where we're putting our hands when we do CPR. And we want to be careful when you do CPR and you're pushing on some chest. We don't want to put our hands right here. That would be dangerous. This is what we call the xiphoid process, a little bony point down here on the bottom, okay? So manubrium, body, xiphoid process. And then this last little thing here, they're calling it a jugular notch. We'll call it a suprasternal notch. It's that notch, that little bump right there at the top of your um, breastbone here. You go all the way up on your fingers, you can feel the soft spot right on your neck that you can push on. That's the supra, superior, right? Sternal notch, spot above the sternum. All right, let's move on now to the next vertebrae. So there were seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and there are five lumbar vertebrae. Yeah, I got, I got nothing fun there. So five lumbar vertebrae. These are the ones that support your lower back. You can see lumbar down here. This is the lower part of your back. These are the thickest vertebrae. Obviously, they have the most weight. All this stuff is pushing down. The ones at the bottom have to bear all that weight from your head, your arms, your chest, organs. So the lumbar vertebrae are going to be very, very thick. In fact, this bottom lumbar vertebrae is a monster down there, okay? Okay. So again, we can kind of see their view of them. Again, you're going to have this little pad where things are going to sit. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about back injuries. You've heard maybe of a herniated disc. Herniated disc. So normally you have these little discs that are sitting in between each vertebra. In fact, I think I got a nice little picture. There we go. Um, so you can see the different vertebrae are sitting here. And then in between, there's these little discs of fibrocartilage and this um, kind of fluid that's in between, kind of like, almost like a jelly. Well, it's severe back pain can be caused by having this kind of thing pop and squeeze out. And you see when it does that, it puts pressure on a nerve, and nerves freak out when that happens. So this is uh, the idea of a herniated disc, a slip disc where the thing actually gets out of place, and uh, surgery has to be done to either remove the disc. They'll end up sometimes fusing these vertebrae together so they don't move anymore. Uh, not a fun situation. you really got to take care of your back. So again, lumbar vertebrae are usually where a lot of this stuff happens. Um, just because you don't have the ribs and stuff to protect it. Um, all right, so that's lumbar. Moving on now, we have sacrum. The sacrum is from those five fused sacral vertebrae that we talked about right at the beginning. Kids still have those. Little kids do, right? newborns. Uh, I don't know the date that they fuse together, but they fuse as you age. Um, so five fused vertebrae form your sacrum, it's one bone. It also forms the rear portion of your pelvic girdle. So this kind of circle, let's see if I got a nice picture of that. There we go. So this is your pelvic girdle. We'll talk more about this later. You've heard us talk about the pubic symphysis right here. Um, we talked about childbirth. And anyway, you see here the back of the pelvic girdle. Your legs come into the sides. The back of it is the sacrum. Okay. As far as a feature that we all want you to know, the sacral hiatus. Sacral hiatus is the gap at the end of the sacrum. It's the site for the epidural block that you get during child labor. 
Um, let's see, I got a nice picture of that. So as we look here, right at this spot right here is the sacral hiatus. Okay, It's a little gap, and what they're going to do is stick a needle and administer a local anesthetic right here. And what it's going to do is kind of numb up everything from all the nerves that come out of this spot are going to be kind of numbed up. So you'll still be able to move your arms and stuff, but you're going to be kind of from the waist down. You're going to be all numb and can't feel anything. The goal is to reduce some of the pain that people experience during labor. All sorts of controversy associated with that, but we don't need to worry about that. All right, so sacral hiatus is the only feature that I need you to know about the sacrum. Moving on to the last bone or the last part of the vertebral column, it's the coccyx sometimes also known as the tailbone, made of the four fused coccygeal vertebrae. This is what your tailbone would look like. Okay, one, two, three, four, the four little bones. Um, you'll see the skeletons we have in class, a lot of the coccyx has been broken into three little bones. You should still be able to count them. Um, that little bit down there at the bottom is your coccyx. Um, what we're gonna do now is talk a little bit about spine curvature. So these are some curves that um, you have four curves in general on your body. Uh, in fact, let me go back a slide and you can see this. You see curve number one, curve number two, curve three, curve four. You know, curve, 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 curve. When you're born, you pretty much have one curve, the thoracic, you're in fetal position. Babies learn to put their heads up, they get the second curve, the cervical curve. Babies start to sit upright and start being able to move and crawl. They start developing that lumbar and then sacral curve down here. So when you take a look at these curves, sometimes you get irregular ones. Normal spine, you can see here, um, what we're going to call a normal spine. You see the thoracic curve. In a condition called kyphosis, you can see the thoracic region has been shoved very far back. Kyphosis up high. Over here in something else called lordosis, the lumbar spine is super exaggerated. That curve is way too far in. You can see how this little girl's standing, sometimes known as sway back, but you can see her little booty sticking out and her uh, back is way, way, way curved there called lordosis. So it's kyphosis, lordosis. There's a last one I'm sure you've heard of. It's what you guys are getting checked on all the time. If you're saying um, scoliosis, then you'd be correct. So scoliosis is our next one, and some uncomfortable pictures for you to look at. Oh, yeah, scoliosis. There's another nice picture. Oh, another fun one. So scoliosis can affect your thoracic part of your vertebrae. Notice it's a horizontal twist as opposed to lordosis and kyphosis, where it was coming more to the side, um, more like, I guess, anterior, posterior. So you have a lumbar scoliosis and a thoracic, and it kind of depends on which region. Is it thoracic region, or is it more lumbar region, okay? So that is our spine curvature little shindig there, okay? So scoliosis, lordosis, kyphosis. All right, last bone that we're gonna talk about is the hyoid bone. Uh, as you look at this bone up here, it might look a little weird. Some people sometimes think it looks kind of like a jaw bone, like a little tooth there and a little tooth there. This bone's actually located on your throat. It's actually what's gonna allow you to talk. This bone is located right here at the top of the larynx. It actually kind of anchors your tongue, um, so it allows speech. Another cool thing about the hyoid bone is it's used in forensics. So a person who has been strangled, uh, this bone will break, and that's one of the first things they look for in a strangulation case is if somebody's hyoid bone has been snapped. So kind of a weird little fun fact for all you people going into like forensics or criminal science or whatever. All right, so the hyoid bone, a weird bone. It's also weird. It does not actually touch any other bones. It's actually anchored in place by tendons and ligaments and muscles and stuff that are going all around it. Okay, pretty dang cool, but it's called the hyoid bone. All right, some muscles are going to actually be named based on the hyoid bone. We have the mylohyoid, the sternohyoid, different mo muscles that you see here that we're going to learn about uh, next semester are all anchored to the hyoid bone, so they have that word in their name. All righty, let's do a little bit of review. So hit pause when you need to. How many ribs are there and which vertebrae are they attached to? Okay, answer. There are 24 ribs and they are attached to the thoracic vertebrae. Easy enough. Next question. A person who has fractured their C4 vertebrae will likely be paraplegic or quadriplegic. Do we know those two terms? Paraplegic and quadriplegic. Para means just two limbs. Quadra means all four limbs. They are paralyzed, right? So... This is wheelchair and you can barely move your head. 
paraplegics are in a wheelchair, but they're actually pushing themselves around with their arms. Usually lower legs are, are, uh, are, are um, out of commission. So C4 vertebrae, where is that at? You should be able to answer this. A fracture to the neck region, C4, would likely result in full paralysis of both arms and legs, which we call a quadriplegic. All right. Last question. What vertebral injury causes immediate death in car accidents? Hmm. Talked about Dale Earnhardt maybe with this one. It'd be the fracture of the dens on the C2 vertebrae. It embeds into the brainstem, and that pretty much just lights out because a lot of your uh, body's functions are controlled um, by the involuntary functions of your brainstem. All right, so that covers it. Those are all of our vertebral notes. Um, we'll get the next video.